good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are in the world today. I am Jermaine Edwards, and on behalf of 451 Research and Errors, I would like to welcome everyone and say thank you for attending today's webcast. Just a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. After the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A period to ask a question. Click the question button and we'll get to as many as possible. If not, we'll respond after the webcast. The presentation will be available to everyone once the webinar is complete. And please provide feedback at the end of the webinar. Leading off the presentation today will be Brian Partridge, who is Vice President of Research at 451 Research. Following Brian will be Evan Whitelock, Product Marketing Executive at Eris. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Jermaine. And thanks for everyone for making time to, uh, to join us today. I think we've got a really interesting topic. So just to quickly review the agenda, I'm going to start off here and set the stage on the topic. Um, show a little bit of a market taxonomy, and then review some data on where we really are relative to IoT adoption and opportunities and challenges that, uh, that customers are seeing in the marketplace. We'll then double click, I'll double click into the specific question around IoT connectivity and what the current state of, of play is there. I'm then gonna hand off to, to Evan, who's going to talk about Eris and their capabilities, both in general and in terms of a new solution. And then we'll conclude and open up the floor to Q&A. We've also got three polls that we're going to ask um, for you to, to respond to as we go through this content. And so you'll see a, um, an option to respond to a poll. So as we get to those, we'll just pause it just a few seconds to allow you to, to, uh, to respond to those polls. So obviously today's discussion is about IoT, the Internet of Things. So we see at 451 here, IoT as being shorthand for all the technologies that are pointed at virtualizing and controlling the physical world with digital. So we believe, as we see here, that IoT is a major um, driver of digital transformation. So we've developed a market taxonomy to capture all of this activity around IoT. So at a very high level, we um, we break the market down into digital enterprise. So these are IoT solutions that uh, are horizontal in their nature, being that you know really anyone with an enterprise campus can deploy them. Digital industry, which includes a lot of where the activity in the market is today. So these are the vertically focused solutions that have been very um, vertically integrated as it were, and have been around quite some time. We ring fence government because there is so much activity related to the application of IoT into government. Uh, and there's also a different set of dynamics around how those solutions are funded and how their uh, ROI is, is uh, calculated. And then, of course, consumer, where a lot of the media attention has been around IoT uh, and certainly a lot of investment and value, but I think uh, a, a lot of us understand that um, you know much of the money that's being made and will be made is is really around these other three segments in enterprise, industry, and government. So that middle ring was a, a subclassification of solutions. What we have out on the outer ring, and I appreciate that this is an eye chart, and, and apologies for that, but uh, those these are the specific use cases. So the condition of this market marketplace today is we've got um, really a, a market that's developed from the outside in. That is to say that um, these solutions were developed to solve a specific problem. Uh, typically, they're, um, uh, as I said, sort of vertically uh, integrated and, and, and a bit siloed. The vision for this market is to start to transition to a position where we move from uh, the inside out. And so that entails, um, you know, much more uh, integration with existing IT systems and processes and being more planful in terms of, you know, uh, deploying things like platforms and unified uh, policies across um, uh, groups like IT and OT. So the question is, you know, a lot of this technology has been around for quite some time. So when 
uh, someone asked me, you know, why is this a market I want to look at now? Why do I need to do something about this now? Uh, this chart really um, uh, tells that story. So the left side of the chart is what the CEO cares about, and the right side of the chart is what the CFO cares about. So from a strategic perspective, um, you know, I, I put up this sort of the value discipline drivers. So if, if anyone on the call went to business school, we learned about the value discipline, which was to say that most companies of, of any size really do well in one of these disciplines. Either they, they're really strong at product leadership, they're really strong at running operational um, activities and operational excellence, or they really identify being uh, intimate with their customers. And so um, the, this, this uh, hypothesis is that most companies are really strong in one area and then um, you know, do just enough to, 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 to sort of stay, um, stay solvent at the others. And the great thing about IoT is there's application for you know, strategic enhancement in all of these. So perhaps the most, um, the most disruptive of that would be to, to really change how your product leadership is defined. So moving from selling products to selling services around those products, steps uh, companies like G have taken to move from you know capitally intensive engine-based models to selling engine as a service, but also can be applied to operational excellence in supply chain, inventory management, and on the customer intimacy front, you can think about retailers really uh, leveraging IoT technologies to understand how their customers are engaging with their digital uh, assets or even physically moving around their store and engaging with their, their products and services. The CFO is interested in some of these market drivers, which are about um, maturity of solution, but, but maybe most importantly, the fact that the cost, the marginal cost to start to drive IoT data from um, uh, off of uh, edge equipment has come down precipitously in the last five years. Bandwidth has come down. The platforms, which are critical to transform IoT data exhaust into insights that we can use in the business, have um, accelerated as, as well as um, you know, economic execution venues like the cloud have all come together at the same time. So here, um, we're, we're actually leveraging data from 451's Voice of the Enterprise survey product line. So we do a series of these. We have a, a specific product around the Internet of Things, which has been in the market for a couple of years now. And so this is a panel that we care and feed for of over 75,000 technology decision makers, which we call the Global Digital Infrastructure Alliance. And so the, on the left side, we ask the question, the simple question, uh, is, you know, are you collecting data from devices and endpoints? So this is moved up um, to where it is today. So 75% of those respondents are in fact collecting data. And when we ask where that data is coming from, um, we see that there's a, a split between what we would classify as IT centric solutions. So those um, endpoints that are most likely sort of managed and under the policy control of the IT group. So data center infrastructure, uh, cameras and surveillance equipment, which can in fact sit outside of IT, smartphones um, as used as you know sensors and tracking devices, facilities equipment, and then on the OT line of business side, you've got um, devices that include building infrastructure, HVAC systems, industry specific solutions, uh, things with wheels, including automobiles and fleet equipment. And then on down the line. So you see it's a, it becomes a long tail of incidents of these of these devices as you get further um, you know down into vertical specific use cases. And so I apologize, this is an infographic and in a bit of an eye chart. Um, the highlights here in the bottom left corner, so the, the biggest year over year gainers, I mentioned we've had this in field for, for a couple of years. Facilities automation um, is growing quickly. Device management, mobile device management, and fleet have have uh, have appreciably driven have um, have grown uh, appreciatively. When we ask in the the top right here about why enterprises are um, are uh, investing in IoT, you know, generally you can think of these as external 
public-facing um, initiatives, so about increasing sales or developing and enhancing their existing product line. Those are less popular than the internal operationally um, focused initiatives, so to either reduce risk or enhance operations. So, um, and, and we think there's a, a really good explanation for that. First of all, the external facing applications are more disruptive. So there's potentially a lot more um, value to be gained, but they're very, it's very disruptive in terms of breaking business processes that exist. Uh, so the, the tolerance for risk is, is a lot less, um, is, is less high on the external facing. But this is a, a mix that we expect to continue to evolve um, in favor of external as, as more experience is gained in the industry. Uh, for those of you that are considering deploying IoT, so what your peers are saying is that on average they have three, over three projects in use. They've got almost two in pilot, another two planned for six months, another three planned um, at the between six and 12 month period, and then the outer period is, is the most, um, they have the most amount of, of projects planned. But the key takeaway here is that um, you know, we're really in a period of active experimentation and proof of concept. Businesses are trying to understand and experimenting with IoT in a variety of contexts to understand where their ROI is and where they can have the most impact relative to their competitive position. Uh, overall, full-time staff uh, is at 13 employees. Overall, again, this is a mixture of SMB, medium enterprise, and and, um, and large. So, cutting those by by those classifications get give you more sense of benchmark where you are. But in general, the the trend is to increase full time staff, but still relatively small teams. Budget for IoT is uh, per, is is very much dominantly going up, and the average so the mean um, spending increase is 30 percent. So this is data that we collect. Uh, on a quarterly basis, so we really have good um, time series tracking on on how things like budgets are progressing. So what gets in the way of uh, IoT? So this has been um, uh, what's changed this in this is that security has moved from number one to number two. So um, lack of funding has moved up. So that's always a consideration. But the, the, the key takeaway here are there are an array of challenges that are both technical in nature, so security um, and IT capacity, but there's also the cultural challenges and the, the economic challenges that need to be overcome to ensure that the CFO is comfortable um, and, and to ensure that you've got the right organizational structure to um, ensure groups like the OT and IT group are working together and rowing in the same direction. So I'll take a breath here and pause to ask the poll question number one. So what we are hoping to get from the audience is, um, you know, where you are relative to your current stage of implementation for IoT. So if you could um, respond to that on the right, we'll just take a, a 30 second break here and, and see how it comes out. Just give it a few more seconds here. Okay, interesting. Well, we've got a um, a good mix of of people here in the audience, um, and so you know we've got a, a pretty even split between limited deployment, early planning, and we do have a few holdouts here with no plans for deployment. So um, appreciate you attending and, and learning a bit more about the topic. So thanks for your responses there. We'll just move on here. And then and do the double click on connectivity. So what's the current state of play here for connectivity? So um, generally IoT devices, so the devices that sit on the edge um, of, of the network are connecting wirelessly. Now there's certainly some exceptions where um, 
where fixed networks still uh, play a role in industrial networking in particular, and where there's Ethernet connectivity available in places like data centers. But this is predominantly a wireless game. And so in wireless technologies, you know, you, you probably likely know that there are two major flavors, right? There is licensed technology that a service provider has paid a uh, paid for license and the ability to, to use uh, a, an allocation of spectrum to deliver service. And then there's the free license exempt side, right, which is where things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and some of these more, um, these newer technologies live. And what's been really interesting is the last, it really, this picture has developed and accelerated in the last two or three years, where it used to be the only game in town was, was really pretty much Wi-Fi and, and, and cellular networks, uh, 2G, 3G. And so the past few years, we've seen uh, not only uh, IoT-specific friendly variants come from the, the operators, so including high bandwidth options like LTE Advanced, but also um, lower bandwidth options, first with um, LTEM, and then soon with narrowband IoT. And then so there's competitors to those to those license options that have come online. So we've got pri proprietary networks. Uh, the most popular of those would be Sigfox, but also companies like uh, Ingenu. And then we've got sort of semi-proprietary, semi-open uh, standard technologies like LuraWAN and Weightless End. So further offering choice to enterprises, but also maybe you know clouding the picture a bit into how you know how do I decide what to use here. But to break it down into the the two major areas of focus, and, and clearly the area of, of focus for for Evan when he picks up is really this divide between cellular and Wi-Fi. And so this has been a binary decision in the past. I um, you know, my equipment is going to stay indoors, so, you know, and, I, and I've already got a campus Wi-Fi network, so I might as well take advantage of it. Or there's some requirement for mobility or quality, um, and so a cellular module makes more sense. And then there's, so on the cellular side, all the way to the left, environmental sensors that sit out on, on physical infrastructure, um, typically been cellular, mobile devices, smart watches now come online with cellular. And out to the right there, industrial equipment, IT equipment, point of sale devices, medical devices, or running around a hospital, typically falling under that blanket of Wi-Fi. But then in the middle here, you've got plenty of examples of devices that either can or should be able to take advantage of the characteristics of both. So there I would include devices like cameras, cars, trucks, meters, cargo containers, uh, cargo trackers, so people trackers, wearables. So there's there's clearly an overlap in the Venn diagram here where um, it's not necessarily 100% clear which technology to choose or both technologies can make sense to, depending on the context of where and how uh, a solution is deployed and what the applications are. So um, when we, again, go back to our data and ask about what is the primary wireless connectivity of choice? The the most popular answer, um, not surprising, is Wi-Fi. You know, it's free to the extent that it's already there. There's some cost for deployment, and a lot and and given the popularity of a lot of those in-building applications, but growing fast is are are all sort of flavors of cellular, and um, you know also showing up it, it is you know in a reasonable. Uh, fashion here are these unlicensed narrowband technologies, and then, um, and then lastly, the narrowband cellular, which you know a lot of people aren't aware of yet, as those solutions are just really starting to hit the market today, or have not yet hit the market. So when we again cut this data to um, by verticals and use cases. We see that um, you know it, th these things sort of track as you might expect. Where you know you see um, in retail point of sale a lot of um, incidents around unlicensed 
uh, Wi-Fi, the same goes for healthcare. Again, you're, you're talking about brick and mortar operations with a lot of devices that don't necessarily need to be mobile outside uh, of the of the um, of the physical place. And then play, things like fleet telematics, where of course um, cellular options are going to be make a lot more sense because of the mobility of those solutions. So the key takeaway is all of these use cases and solutions are using some of these technologies. It really comes down to it, you know, the questions that, that Evan will, will get into a lot more around what is the application requirement, what's the requirement for mobility, what's the requirement for security will really drive the decision. And so again, um, a double click into Wi-Fi, 75% of uh, respondents pick this one. The in-building cases predominate uh, are predominant. So I mentioned hospitals, retail, also government, and in, and things like data center infrastructure lags because of the availability of wired connectivity in those in those places. And then the least popular answer is is are these narrowband cellular options that are just coming online? So that's just 14.2 percent are saying that. Um, uh, you know they're they're planning to deploy those technologies. I expect this to take off like a rocket ship as these solutions become more commercialized. Uh, as importantly, the module costs come down uh, to to actually buy LTEM and MBIOT and MBLT modules. So uh, watch this space. This will be a, a fast growing area. And then of course um, in our in our broadband technologies. This is sort of the middle ch child here, so chosen by 57.3. Uh, on the go, mobile solutions uh, rank the highest here, so fleet supply chain. Healthcare is tracking lower than and expected in this one, and, and that's really about the mix of in-hospital applications versus remote use cases. So it, it gives us a sense that uh, there's more volume um, of data happening in the in the um, in the hospitals as opposed to on things like wearables or in home. So to conclude to, to my section and, and as a, a handoff point here to Evan, um, what we saw here is that the Internet of Things is a market that's accelerating. So we sort of talked about the strategic reasons why we also looked at data that says, yeah, this is real and that budgets are being allocated and staff is being added but um, you know, there, but there are challenges, right? We talked about about those. When we talked about connectivity, you know, that a smart choice here in the connectivity field is can be make or break in terms of both the application quality of experience, as well as our ability to to main maintain economic viability of these solutions. So it's really critical to make smart um, smart choices here. Those choices that we've had have um, expanded. As new technologies have come on on both the licensed and unlicensed side of the of the coin, um, but you know, those choices have been binary in the past. You you went one direction or the other. So the question that I'm asking, and certainly Eris wants to ask, is: Is there a better way? So with that, I'm going to pass to Evan, and 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 he can pick it up from here. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate it, and uh, and thank you for for you know going through and setting the stage for us as we continue to kind of double click down, as, as you said, into into IoT connectivity, into some of the options, and um, and and one one of the things that, that I'm going to do is to get into you know expand a bit more on what are the you know what have been the choices so far to date, looking at cellular, looking at Wi-Fi, uh, you know especially, and and what are some of the options to solve some of those challenges, and how can we um, you know, as, as, as IoT deployments can continue to evolve, how do we make a better connectivity option for them? So before I jump into that, I do just want to introduce Eris very briefly for those of you who are listening who may not be, uh, you know, too familiar with who we are or what we do. Um, Eris is a global IoT solutions provider, and uh, historically we focused on providing uh, connectivity specifically for IoT deployments. And as we've evolved as a company and grown, um, you know, we've added, you know, IoT platforms platforms, analytic platforms, um, you know, as we provide for more solutions and, and more value to our customers up the, the IoT technology stack. Um, but we do have a truly global presence. We have offices around the world. We're headquartered in the Silicon Valley, and uh, our offices range from Chicago to India to the UK and also a joint venture with SoftBank 
uh, in Japan. Um, to put a little bit of context about where we sit in the market, I want to you know, briefly touch on a couple of numbers. Um, being a global company, we do have connectivity reach in over 190 countries. And, uh, you know, today our network's primarily cellular, um, are uh, supporting over 10 million units on the network. And those are uh, active deployed um, devices uh, that are part of IoT deployment. Um, collectively, those are uh, transmitting over a billion IoT messages per day. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that 10 million unit number actually puts us in the top 10 worldwide in terms of IoT units uh, under management. So hopefully that, that provides for those of you who are not familiar, a little context of why you know, we are here talking about this solution today. Um, and before we jump in, uh, I believe we got one poll real quick, which you know, what, what I wanted to hear from you guys is, uh, if you could just take a, you know, a quick moment to answer this question, uh, which technologies, uh, especially some of the ones that we've talked about so far, are you most likely to use? And, and again, we're, we're narrowing kind of more specifically on, on cellular Wi-Fi. Um, and there are, there are a bunch of other technologies that, that Brian had mentioned, LPWA, other unlicensed, other licensed technologies that are coming out. And we'll take a deeper dive into those at a later point, but especially looking at Wi-Fi and cellular today, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on which ones you're thinking about. So if you could take another 30 seconds or so to answer this question, and then we will take a look at the results. All right, let's take another 10 seconds or so, and then we will take a look at the results. Okay. Um, so it, it looks like a good chunk of you are, are interested in seeing, um, you know, what can be done with multiple technologies. About 40% of you are interested in both Wi-Fi and cellular, which is great. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the, the drivers and limited deployments, you know, um, with that in the past and, and what we can do to help solve some of those challenges. Um, and then it looks like a lot of you also want to use, you know, 42% selected you want to use multiple technologies. And, uh, and hopefully today we'll, we'll address some of the challenges that you're, you've likely faced and, uh, and present some solutions that might make it easier for you to deploy those, the, the mixed technology deployment. So uh, thank you for answering, um, answering those questions. And, uh, and now we'll go ahead and jump into, um, into what we wanted to talk about now, which is taking a look at, at Wi-Fi and cellular and how they've been utilized for IoT deployments in the past. And, you know, really kind of what it comes down to is traditionally people have been forced to pick one technology or the other. And, and we're going to dive into the pros and cons that each one's offering and talk a little bit about, you know, which, what types of use cases they've been, uh, you know, primarily, you know, designed for or, or used by. And Brian touched on a lot of that. Um, but, you know, we kind of view the, that, you know, siloed technology deployments, meaning deployments that had to pick a specific technology and live with the pros and cons, uh, you know, certainly helped get a lot of IoT solutions up and running and expanding. And, and, uh, and however, you know, the, the flexibility and scalability there has, has been limited. And as we look towards the future of IoT, it's kind of our belief that, uh, you know, deployment shouldn't be limited to one technology or the other. And, um, as solutions become more complex and as they become larger and add more value, uh, they'll need to be able to utilize the, the benefits of all the technologies, optimize across the benefits of multiple technologies, uh, and not be limited, like I said, by those, uh, those cons for each one. So, uh, you know, especially as we, as we drill down further into Wi-Fi and cellular today, that's a lot of what we want to talk about is, uh, you know, what have been some of the challenges with Wi-Fi, what have been some of the challenges with cellular, and how do you go about creating a hybrid or, or mixed technology uh, connection that gives you the best of both worlds while also solving some of those challenges that um, uh, that previous implementations may have faced. And so first, by looking at, at Wi-Fi, um, you know, some of the pros and cons of Wi-Fi, obviously cost is, is one of the largest drivers for why Wi-Fi has been used um, uh, as, as a technology choice for IoT deployments or connectivity choice. And that's obviously not just the, uh, you know, the cost of, of network access itself. Connecting to a private network, um, uh, you know, uh, in most use cases is free, uh, free to the solution deployer. Um, and in addition to the, you know, the, the very lower free transport costs, uh, the hardware costs are, are lower, especially when compared to solutions like cellular. Uh, so, you know, the, the Wi-Fi modules are significantly cheaper. Um, and, and so there's, there's a lot of drivers for why Wi-Fi networks have been picked in the past. 
Um, however, there's, there's limitations there. Coverage is certainly an issue. And so for fixed deployments in and around Wi-Fi networks, for the most part, Wi-Fi had you know, pretty good coverage and often had a strong signal uh, for that area. But for anything that was moving or for anything that wanted to, uh, uh, that, that needed a larger coverage footprint, Wi-Fi presented limitations there. Um, but really, I think that, that two of the largest concerns with Wi-Fi networks are security and then visibility and control. Uh, security, obviously, there's uh, you don't know what other devices are connecting to that same network. Um, for those of you that remember the, the Target hack a couple of years ago, um, which exposed a lot of uh, credit card information, that was done because um, you know hackers were able to access an IoT device over a, a you know, Wi-Fi network. Um, and so, you know, one of the problems with Wi-Fi networks, even if you have secure access through credentials and so forth, uh, other devices that have access to that same network who have gotten past that credential hurdle, um, uh, there's a lot of security risks there once you're both on that same network. Um, but then also in the ongoing performance of a device on a Wi-Fi network, uh, they don't usually come with managed platforms that give you visibility into usage and performance and is the device uh, behaving the way it's supposed to? Is the end user getting what the solution was supposed to, that we, what, what it was designed to deliver? Um, very limited visibility into the ongoing performance. Um, and while that, that doesn't you know, um, necessarily have a major cost impact in terms of potential overage charges like it would in cellular, um, the performance of the solution, the end user experience can be severely impacted, um, you know, resulting in a, in, a, in a bad user experience, an unhappy customer. Um, and so, um, you know, certainly while it's is, is always been attractive for Wi-Fi and always will be attractive, there are, uh, there are definitely limitations there. And then as we flip to the other, uh, the other side, cellular, um, you know, while, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the flip side in a lot of ways where it, it has significantly better coverage, especially on a wide, you know, uh, a large scale and especially on a global scale. Um, but that comes at a premium cost. You know, the cellular data rates are significantly more expensive than, than in most cases the free Wi-Fi networks. Um, however, there are other advantages of, of cellular. Um, I had mentioned the, the visibility and control as a con for, for Wi-Fi, but uh, that's also a benefit of cellular, where most IoT-focused deployments and cellular connections come with a management platform uh, that provides visibility into device performance and behavior and so forth. Um, cellular networks are also, uh, by design, far more secure, um, you know, eliminating some of those security you know, concerns of Wi-Fi and, 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 if nothing else, significantly reducing them. Uh, but also on the installation and activation, uh, cellular networks uh, or cellular devices oftentimes can come pre-provisioned or, or pre-activated so they have out-of-the-box functionality. Uh, installers can have devices activated earlier on in the supply chain. So when they get to the site, whether it's uh, installing a solar panel or whatever else it might be, that device can just be turned on, plug the power, and it's already connected on the network. There is no Wi-Fi credential management. There is no establishing or configuring uh, access to a network that can all come out of the box. Um, uh, but again, you know, on the on the flip side, cellular does come at a, a, a higher cost for indoor, indoor deployments. Coverage is, uh, uh, you know, signals often don't penetrate indoor as well as as other networks like a Wi-Fi. Uh, and location service isn't always accurate as accurate, which obviously doesn't apply to every IoT solution. But there are certainly solutions that require uh, very specific location information, which uh, you know, by itself, cellular uh, doesn't uh, doesn't always provide the most accurate information. So, um, so again, you know, benefits and limitations for both technologies. And really, you know, one of the you know the sweet spot would be to how can we you know create a solution that optimizes the value of both technologies, that's able to leverage the low cost benefit of Wi-Fi while you know uh, you know experiencing the, the higher reliability of cellular. Um, and there's been several different ways to do that in the past, and a lot of them have been kind of clunky and, uh, you know, probably put the, um, uh, put the work up front on, on the solution deployer to go figure out uh, how to make that work. And it's, it's going to start with dual technology hardware, obviously, uh, having both cellular and Wi-Fi modules on the device. And, uh, and even for some of the, the solutions that we'll talk about next, that'll still be the case. Um, but oftentimes the device is going to have to have a lot of intelligence with, you know, strong device management capabilities um, uh, to make sure that, that, you know, connections can be managed and, uh, and information on performance can be routed through back to the, you know, the, the, the solution manager, if you will, um, which oftentimes can be very difficult, especially without kind of a central place to, to view and monitor those devices. 
Um, because ultimately one of the challenges is that's going to be two subscriptions. Uh, that comes at a, a higher maintenance and a higher cost to have both those up at the same time. Likely going to be from two different vendors. If, if you have a Wi-Fi aggregator that you, that you can use to get access to uh, larger Wi-Fi network access as opposed to private network access, um, while also having a, you know, a vendor or a supplier for your cellular connection. Um, as I mentioned, those designs are going to be complicated. The installations are going to require a lot of work, um, you know, and, and, and installers are going to be required to do more to make sure that those devices are connected to those networks uh, from the beginning. And then ultimately, limited visibility and control is one of the challenges because those, the devices, you know, whether it's a Wi-Fi connection or it's, it's instead using cellular, there won't be a seamless set or a single set of, uh, of you know, tools or reports or visibility. Um, it'll be it'll be kind of up to uh, up to the you know the person or the team supporting that solution to to piece together information from either multiple platforms or multiple sources to understand is the device connecting the way it's supposed to? Uh, am, am I getting the right information that I need, and what can I do to fix it? Um, that's constantly been been a challenge. And expanding on that a little bit, one of the reasons that's been a challenge is because. Um, there isn't a, a single platform that, that's able to manage uh, those technologies. And as I mentioned, likely going to, you know, that, that deployment that's going to use both technologies is likely going to be pieced together in, in a way where it doesn't, uh, you know, the two pieces don't fit together perfectly and they don't provide a single consolidated set of management capabilities. Uh, that lack of visibility and control is going to result in, in high, high management costs. Not knowing exactly what you know what the Wi-Fi connection is doing versus cellular, having different level of visibility, different reporting capabilities, um, instead of a, a single set, which which is going to you know obviously make it much easier for the support team to really understand what's going on. Um, and ultimately, I think the biggest concern there is that actually uh, um, it, it'll hide potential security breaches. If you don't have a single set, a clear view as to what the device is, you know, either connection is doing, um, you're likely not going to notice if there are any security breaches. Um, and, and you won't notice them until further down the road once the issue's already been, uh, you know, taken full effect and, and cause, you know, uh, cause you quite a bit of headache. And so um, that limited control exposes that threat. You know, the operational complexities are obviously increased there. Uh, different sets for different troubleshooting processes to determine an issue, depending on which network it is. Uh, different issue, issue escalation processes. Who do you call if, if the cellular is not working? That's going to be different than what if the device isn't connecting to Wi-Fi properly. Um, and it results in a much more reactive approach to maintaining devices and supporting and, and, and fixing those issues. Um, and then last but certainly not least is, is you know, these manual processes um, uh, are really going to limit your ability to scale this solution as you grow. Um, the more complex it is to manage, the more, uh, you know, the more upfront, the more difficult the installation or setup is up front, uh, it, it's going to severely impact your ability to scale, uh, especially as you look to grow your solution and, and enter new markets and so forth. And so the, the solution that I wanted to talk to you about today is, uh, is how a, a single consolidated connectivity management platform can solve those challenges that a dual connection device is going to see. Uh, you know, and it starts with being able to, from the platform level, manage those networks. What that allows you to do versus at the device level is, uh, is, is optimize between coverage and cost and make sure that um, the platform is able to dictate which network is used. It takes the, the you know, whether it's Wi-Fi or cellular, um, uh, you know, a step out of the equation where that's not what, what's most important. What's most important is, is for you to be able to manage which connection to use. And so use the Wi-Fi networks when they're available um, and, uh, and, you know, for lower cost reasons, obviously, or use cellular for high reliability solutions or mission critical solutions. And being able to manage that from the platforms means that you're able to turn them on and off and, um, and not have to worry about what, what that device is doing. The platform gives you much deeper visibility and much deeper control over what's going on. Not only that, but it's going to kind of standardize your set of troubleshooting processes and your set of reporting capabilities. Um, by having the same level of granular access and visibility to Wi-Fi versus cellular connections, to see when that, wi when that device is on Wi-Fi, it's still reporting usage information back up to a single platform the same way that it does. So you can see 
um, you know, how the device is operating. Is it sending the right amount of data? Is it, you know, what's the, the frequency at which it's reporting? Is it maintaining its connections the way that it's supposed to? All the information that's going to allow you to, to you know, much more quickly, uh, you know, identify what the issue is and then figure out what's the next step to fix that issue. Um, and it also enables you to leverage cellular as a control channel. Um, so that if the Wi-Fi network is not connecting properly, you can send updated credentials down over cellular from the platform. Um, you can force a re-register or a, an, a, an additional attempt onto the Wi-Fi network, or if the Wi-Fi is not reliable, you can force it over to the cellular channel to make sure that device is reporting uh, correctly. When done from the platform level, what it does is it significantly reduces the amount of work that in design work that it's going to take to make this solution possible, and it reduces the operational complexity of managing this, this dual, uh, dual technology approach um, and, and ultimately resulting in, in several layers of value beyond just, you know, improved coverage and reduced costs, but also things like being able to eliminate truck rolls. You can remotely troubleshoot Wi-Fi networks. You can remotely reconfigure networks. You don't have to send a technician out to manually reconfigure a Wi-Fi connection like you would in, in most other traditional kind of siloed deployments, as I've mentioned. Um, and then also be able to simplify installation. At the time of installation, you can leverage the out-of-the-box capabilities of cellular to, make, to establish a connection, get that device connected, and then push down those credentials, uh, those Wi-Fi credentials at a later time. Um, and then lastly, to, to wrap up with just a couple of real-world examples of how this, this, is, you know, this has worked in real life and how this can work in real life, um, you know, looking at three primary you know, kind of buckets of solutions, and the first is, is really more around residential monitoring solutions um, in and around homes where there are typically, you know, uh, Wi-Fi access, um, including residential solar, home health care, and others, where, um, you know, if, if the, uh, the solution deployer gets access to those Wi-Fi credentials, the homeowner's Wi-Fi credential, they can be sent down over the cellular control channel to that device from the platform to gain access to that homeowner's Wi-Fi network so that that device can be connected on a significantly lower cost um, lower cost network. Now, one of the things that this, from the platform level, it does is it makes it so it's a very secure connection. Authentication is done by, uh, you know, um, by the platform operator, by the network operator from a single point. So regardless of if the device has connections or not, authentication, a second level of authentication can still be, can still be made to prevent, you know, that target example I had referenced where, uh, even though um, a device had those credentials, another device had those credentials, was on that network, and was able to uh, to gain access and, and, and um, uh, you know force fraudulent activity. That can all be managed by a single platform that can manage and authenticate those credentials. Uh, another example would be around uh, you know mobile solutions, fleet solutions, whether that's uh, fleet management or even connected car. Um, you know, uh, be able to have intelligent network capabilities so that you know, um, the, the, the information that you need to gather on a regular basis, GPS information, whatever it might be, uh, temperature, can, you know, information updates from, uh, you know, from the refrigerated, uh, you know, container, that can all be sent over a cellular network. Typically lower usage, typically lower cost, but, but high value, and you want to make sure that's going through at a regular basis. And then if there are any, say, firmware updates or application or uh, driver logs that need to be updated, especially with the new mandates coming out, um, there can be intelligence in the application, intelligence in the platform to say, wait until we get inside a Wi-Fi network before sending that information out. Um, be able to leverage the low-cost Wi-Fi networks um, to, to really optimize cost across different levels of application data. And again, to do it in a, in a, in a, a managed and secure way so that, um, you know, homeowners' networks can be, you know, managed and authenticated from the platform, for example, in the, you know, example of the connected car. Um, but then, you know, access to, say, uh, depots or truck stops or whatever it might be where there are Wi-Fi networks available, being able to gain access to those and do that in a secure way uh, from the platform enables that, you know, uh, to optimize uh, cost across the different types of data there, uh, especially for devices moving in and out of Wi-Fi and or cellular. And then the last, um, you know, point of sale solutions around, you know, population centers where there are commonly um, Wi-Fi networks whether that's digital signage or cashless transactions, uh, credit card machines, uh, vending machines, and so forth, where very similarly, um, you know, cellular can be used as a backup to make sure that that transaction information can get through uh, in the case of a Wi-Fi outage or in the case of credentials um, not being provided. 
but where credentials can be managed and sent down to the device remotely. And again, that keeps being the, you know, the key aspects of this solution, being able to manage those credentials remotely um, enables uh, new networks uh, to, be, to be added as you deploy uh, maybe a new mall or maybe a new, uh, uh, a new store or new location uh, where additional credentials can be added securely um, at a later time. So uh, a couple examples of how this works in the real life or in the real world um, and, and how we see you know, this type of solution solving some of those challenges um, you know, that have traditionally been there for uh, you know, either picking Wi-Fi or picking cellular or trying to find a clunky way to make both work. Um, uh, you know, examples of how the platform can, can help make that easier. So, you know, just to wrap up really quickly, and then we have one quick poll, and then we'll get into your questions. But, um, you know, multi-technology, especially in today and especially in tomorrow's IoT world, um, multiple technologies do add different levels of value. And, and so, you know, one of the challenges and, and one of the goals is to find ways to, you know, for your solution, how to optimize across all of the of these new technologies and not be forced to live with the pros and cons of, of kind of traditional, uh, traditional networks and traditional choices. Um, and as you do that, you know, management is, is key, you know, how to manage those networks, um, how to make sure that, uh, that security threats are identified, that fraudulent use is identified, that, that costs are controlled and performance is maintained over time, uh, can really only be done with, with a platform that gives you that, that uh, you know, that single set of, of reporting, management, troubleshooting capabilities. Um, because without it, uh, you know, your operational complexity is, you know, likely to be very, very difficult and, and possibly to the point where it doesn't make sense to maintain that level of a solution because it's just too challenging. So, uh, you know, a single platform that enables this type of hybrid connection is, uh, is really the, the most scalable way to go about designing it um, and, uh, and something that uh, uh, that's kind of what we're, we're working, working on over here at Eris. So um, with that, I believe we have just one more poll question for you. Um, and uh, then we'll get to your, your question. Thank you very much for uh, for listening today. And so, one of the things we want to do is get feedback from you on on what uh, what your greatest IoT challenge is right now, uh, especially as we plan, you know, kind of what our next uh, you know next set of webinars might be around. Uh, want to hear from you what the topics are that you want to learn more about, or, or challenges in those areas that you want to you want help figuring out. Uh, and we love to uh, to put to you know put together some material there for you. So. Uh, please take about 15, 20 seconds here to, uh, to answer this question as to what your greatest IoT challenge is, and then we will, uh, we will jump into questions. All right, another five seconds or so, we'll take a look. So, um, not surprisingly, it uh, looks like security is a big winner here. So over 53% said security, um, which is great because we do have a couple things we're working on on security. We know it's a big deal. It looks like it dropped down to 40, but still a good chunk of you that are interested in, in security. Um, complexity is another another topic that you guys are interested in. So that, that's great to see, and, and we'll you know um, be on the lookout for, for more coming from us on these topics, and we'd be happy to address these for you. So. Um, so with that, thank you very much for, for listening to my part of this webinar, and, uh, and um, I will uh, talk, I guess, so one more slide on conclusions, or, or we do have some resources. There we go. Sorry, I forgot this one. Uh, if you want to learn more um, about any of the things we talked about or what we're working on at ARIS, please feel free to check out our website. We've got uh, um, a couple different things that will be interesting for you, um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, and we'd be happy to answer them. So. Um, I believe now uh, we'll jump into the questions. Yeah, thanks, Evan. That was great. Uh, and I'll pick up the questions and sort of mo moderate these. Just a reminder to the audience, if you do have a question, please input it on the, uh, the question tab to the right. I'll, I'll start with one for you, um, Evan. So it, the question is, what costing scenarios are available for cellular without paying for a lot of data and high rates? Uh, example, a standard cell phone setup. So I know that Eris has built a lot of its business around solving that question. So how would you answer that one? Great, great question. And so what it looks like is, uh, is obviously there, you know, there's kind of two different types of buckets of cellular plans. There's the more consumer focused plans, which it sounds like you, uh, you know, if, um, you know, whoever asked that question, that's kind of what you've seen. And, uh, and that does become a challenge to build an IoT, you know, business model around some of those consumer focused plans, which are, 
you know, very focused on, uh, on high, high data, right? We're, we're very greedy with our cell phones, and so we love our unlimited plans. Uh, most IoT solutions are not that. So, um, you know, the way we've gone about that is, is you know, we at Aris, we have our own billing platform that allows us to create customized rate plans, whether that's in the kilobytes, megabytes, or gigabytes, depending on, you know, exactly how much data, um, you know, your solution needs. And so, um, you know, if you have a solution you're working on and, and you have, you know, some specific data plans, you know, or, or you know, different usage profiles you'd love to talk through, um, our, uh, you know, our, our salespeople would love to answer those questions for you. Great. Lots of questions about uh, presentation downloads. We'll, we'll make those available to you after uh, the webinar here so that the answer is yes, we'll get those to you. Um, another one for you here, I, I'm not sure if you're prepared to answer it, but the question is a specific one around security vulnerability. So the question mm -hmm. is, doesn't a hybrid connection schema increase vulnerability to man in the middle of attack? Sure. And, and I, I get the concerns and I would say, you know, really, no, not necessarily, especially if it's designed and managed correctly. And, and especially the way that, that we've gone about building our hybrid connection, um, you know, really because, you know, we'll have the ability to devices really from the network and, and platform level and, and establish, you know, direct customer VPNs and so forth to protect that data as it goes through. Um, you know, we're able to, to really authenticate and make sure that, that the device is, is, is actually who it's supposed to be and sending the information that it's supposed to. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously not, not as much of a concern over the cellular side of it, but, you know, solving that Wi-Fi security challenge is actually kind of where we started when thinking about this solution. And so, um, you know, what I'll do is, is if you have any, you know, uh, you know, whoever asked that question or whoever else would like to learn more, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I believe my information is yep, now up on the screen. Um, be happy to provide you with some more information specifically about how we're going about solving the security problem for, um, you know, for this hybrid connection. Great. Here's one maybe we both could answer, and the question is, why would an enterprise choose an MVNO like Aris versus a carrier like AT&T? Um, well, actually, the to so to start the topic of this webinar would be one reason. I don't think uh, AT&T has a solution that takes into consideration this multiple approach. But the reason that Aris and, and frankly, some others have been successful in the market is because they uh, have done a really good job of serving their customers and understanding the business needs, but you know, most importantly, understanding how to um, craft connectivity offers that make sense for the types of use cases that they're going after. The mm -hmm. other major um, capability that an, an MBO brings is that ability to triage uh, multiple networks and support um, you know, more um, uh, aggressive capabilities relative to roaming and, and the economic side of it. I don't know, Aaron, how, would, you, would you add anything to that? Yeah, you know, obviously from, you know, anything coming from me is, is uh, you know, I'll, I'll be slightly biased there. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think in general, though, uh, you know, the mentality that we have is, is that we are, uh, you know, uh, just a, a cellular connectivity provider. We really want to be um, you know, uh, a provider that helps me helps customers really pick and choose the right technologies for their deployment. And, and that may be cellular, that may be Wi-Fi, that may be something else. And, you know, so we want to provide them the platform capabilities to optimize that deployment um, and work with them, not to restrict them to, you know, any single carrier, or any single network, but, um, you know, give them the technology and the carrier options that they, uh, that, that are going to best serve their business. So, um, so, uh, you know, great question, um, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, Brian, I appreciate, uh, you know, your words on that, too. Hey, Evan, I, I got one that's specifically about the new capability. So, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's asking what carrier technologies you support with the platform. So, mm -hmm. I guess I just leave it there. What, 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 what technologies is, are supported on the carrier side? Yeah, good question. So from a cellular perspective, uh, you know, we have, uh, we support 2G, 3G, and 4G LTE um, networks and, and, and have several different options there today. Um, and that's across GSM as well as CDMA. Uh, so, you know, really a technology agnostic, whatever technology that, uh, um, that you're currently working with or, or have interest in. And, you know, a lot of it's going to depend based on, you know, specific uh, deployment use cases, how long they're going to be out in the field, where they need coverage. Uh, you know, throughput requirements, all that good stuff. So, you know, our approach is always to sit down, take a look at what your specific needs will be, and then and then recommend the you know what we think is the right technology. Um, but uh, uh, we do support all technologies. 
Uh, Evan, another one specifically on the new platform. So um, the question is really about how does it actually work in terms of applying the business logic based on place and, and such? So how, how do you actually um, have the, the, you know, the, the sort of the network platform understand what the application policies are? How does that happen? Yeah, great question. And so, you know, it, a lot of it's going to start with we are building, uh, you know, and depending on what's, what makes the most sense for each individual deployment, either a, a device client or a, uh, an SDK um, to enable the, the creation of a customized device client. So, you know, that client will be able to, uh, you know, serve as a connection manager, be programmed with rules um, that, that are configurable and, uh, and can be changed over the air um, as to, uh, you know, when the device should pick Wi-Fi, when it should pick cellular, um, are there any limitations on, you know, only send, uh, you know, packet sizes below a certain amount over cellular, send the bigger ones over Wi-Fi. You know, the, the, the goal is, is to have all of that be customized based on what the, you know, each customer, each deployment specific requirements will be, um, and then facilitate the management of, of all those rules, uh, you know, via the platform down to that client. So, uh, you know, naturally as well, um, what this also does is, is it, is it enables, um, you know, um, more application control. So if a customer or, you know, solution deployer wants additional, you know, um, intelligence into their application and wants to have a, you know, a very sophisticated set of rules and capabilities there, you know, this, this platform and, you know, and client solution will, uh, will facilitate the delivery of those rules um, in a much more streamlined and secure way. So uh, lots of different ways to customize it and, you know, really the, the, the theme of flexibility and the theme of customization, especially with regards to the, um, uh, you know, to the rules and to, you know, how it picks the network um, is, you know, was, was top of mind as we were building this in one of our primary objectives. Okay. And this is um, maybe the last question we can take here. So, and it's about cost. And I don't know if you've worked through this yet, but is there a way to characterize what you expect um, someone to see for cost advantages of this solution? Yeah, so, um, and, and, you know, there, there are a lot of levers in that equation. Um, you know, a lot of it will depend on, you know, what is the actual usage profile? Uh, are we in the, you know, the, the, the low megabytes? Are we in the, you know, the dozens of megabytes or hundreds or even in the gigabytes? Generally speaking, um, the higher the, the, you know, the more data that's being sent and the more that you get that on a, uh, say, for example, a free Wi-Fi network, um, you'll see a, a, a much higher, um, uh, you know, reduction in, in total costs across the deployment. Um, but then, you know, another lever is, okay, how many devices are actually going to be in and around Wi-Fi networks, for example? Um, in the case of, a, you know, maybe a connected car or fleet that's going to be coming in and out, um, in and out of Wi-Fi and, and cellular, uh, a lot of it's going to be tend, depend on where they're driving and what truck stops they're able to stop in and so forth. So um, a lot of levers there. Um, you know, what we've seen, you know, traditionally is that given um, – Given the you know the difference in, in cellular costs versus free Wi-Fi network access, for example, or even uh, you know partners who who have uh, you know aggregated Wi-Fi networks and, and provide those um, at a, at a much cheaper rate than cellular, uh, the you know the cost savings on an ongoing basis can be pretty material. So a um, lot of variables, so hard to answer very specifically, but uh, um, you know very very good indicators that this will be for a lot of solutions um, very impactful to the bottom line. Thanks, Evan. So looking at the clock, I want to be respectful of people's time. So we'll call it there. On behalf of Evan, um, uh, I'd like to really thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to, to just spend an hour with us. We appreciate that. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass over to Jermaine to, uh, to close the call. Thanks. Hey, I just want to thank everybody for attending the webinar. Brian, Evan, you guys did a great job. Um, the slides will be available um, after the webinar. And thank you, and everyone have a great afternoon.